and welcome. My name is Kate Bum, and I'm with the Knowledge to Action team here at HELP as the Early Years Lead. I'll be the host for this video, Community Data at Work, Exploring Local Patterns and Trends in the Early Years. This video is intended to help viewers navigate the EDI Wave 7 Community Profiles, released in February 2020, and learn some tips from HELP about how we assist communities to interpret their data. Here's an overview of the topics that will be covered in this video. We will provide a brief overview of the Early Development Instrument, or the EDI, and show you how to find community profiles and other EDI resources on our website. We will follow this with a walkthrough of the community profiles, explaining some of the features, and reviewing the data provided that includes provincial, community, and neighborhood level EDI data. We'll also introduce some ideas about situating EDI data in context, and provide some examples of the questions we consider at help when unpacking EDI data that may be helpful as you navigate your own community's profile. Here's just a little bit about help. Monitoring across the life course and not just a single point in time is critical. It allows us to see changes across time and link our early years information with outcomes in later life. For these reasons, we have developed other questionnaires for use at critical transition points in children's development. Altogether, these questionnaires make up HELP's Child Development Monitoring System and capture information from pre-K through to grade 7 with the Youth Questionnaire in Development. These questionnaires gather perspectives from a range of individuals including parents, teachers, and youth themselves. HELP collects population level data, which is different from individual assessment data. Individual assessments, assessing one child, may lead to a report used by parents, schools, or clinicians toward a treatment plan or individual education plan, whereas population level monitoring, assessing populations of children, creates reports based on groups of children used by school districts, governments, community partners to generate programs or make funding decisions for all children. The EDI is not a diagnostic measure, and it is not a teacher or school evaluation tool. So what is the EDI? The EDI questionnaire was developed at McMaster University by Drs. Dan Offord and Magdalena Janus. It's a questionnaire that has 103 items covering five child development domains. Kindergarten teachers complete the EDI questionnaires on their students in February, which gives students a chance to adjust to school and teachers the chance to build a relationship with them. The intention of the EDI questionnaire is to reflect the development of the whole child. These are the five EDI scales that measure domains of development known to be good predictors of adult health, education, and social outcomes. They are physical health and well-being, language and cognitive development, communication skills and general knowledge, emotional maturity, and social competence. A copy of the EDI questionnaire can be found on our website if you're interested. Completed EDI questionnaires are grouped together to give a snapshot of how children are doing at the school, school district, neighborhood, and provincial level. It measures the rates of developmental vulnerability of children at a population level. Each scale has a vulnerability cutoff, and if children fall below this cutoff, they are considered to be vulnerable on that area of development. When we say vulnerable, we mean that without additional support and care, a child may experience future challenges in school and society. Research has demonstrated that the cutoffs have predictive capabilities. Being below the cutoff in kindergarten has a direct relationship to children's scores in later grades. When considering vulnerability rates, it is important to note that some level of developmental vulnerability is to be expected in populations of children. At HELP, we consider 10% to be a reasonable benchmark. This is based on biological and birth data and research from almost two decades of EDI data where we have seen many neighborhoods that have had vulnerability rates of less than 10%. The following graphic shows the data collection history for the EDI in BC. The EDI is province-wide, all school districts participate. To date, we have collected data for over 290,000 kindergarten children in BC since 2001. It's a world-class data set. As you can see, we have grouped data collection into waves, which encompasses two to three years. We invite school districts to participate in waves depending on the size of the district. Larger districts typically participate once in a wave, while smaller dist districts participate every, every year or two out of the three years of the wave to ensure that the number of children participating in each neighborhood is large enough to be reliable and to track meaningful change over time. 
Today we're, we are reporting on the Wave 7 data, and this year is the first year of data collection for Wave 8. HELP's mission is that we are dedicated to improving the health and well-being of children through interdisciplinary research and mobilizing knowledge. We want to ensure that people feel confident interpreting and using HELP's data. We know that data alone does not provide answers, but it does shine a light on patterns and trends in children's vulnerability vulnerability or experiences and creates opportunities for dialogue and reflection toward action. Now we'll take a look at the EDI community profiles and discuss some strategies for reflecting on your community's profile. The data in these reports is aggregated by postal code, so it represents children that live in the community, with communities being determined by school district boundaries. We use the term community synonymously with school district in these profiles. The profiles present different levels of EDI data from provincial to community and neighborhood level. By providing these different levels of data, the reader is able to see their neighborhood in the context of their community, their community in the context of the province. The reports provide both single point in time wave 7 data, but also trends across time, both short term trends from wave 6 to wave 7 and long term trends from wave 2 to wave 7. Using the HELP website, here is how to navigate to the list of community profiles. Using the menu bar along the top of the page, click on Maps and Data and select EDI from the drop-down menu. You will be guided to this EDI landing page where you can find all kinds of information about the EDI. To get to the list of community profiles, click on your EDI reports. This is the list of community profiles available. As a reminder, we are reporting on community data using school district boundaries. You can click on the community of your choice. This will take you to your community's landing page, and to get to your profile, click on your EDI report. You can also explore things like our interactive maps or EDI resources page. The profiles begin with an introduction to some important help information and EDI basics. We have reviewed some of this information in this video, but encourage you to read more about the important concepts that underpin EDI data in this introduction. As mentioned, the profiles provide both point-in-time data, meaning data from Wave 7 that was collected between 2016 and 2019, and trends over time from Wave 2. To begin, we'll take a look at the Provincial Wave 7 data, starting on page 18 of the Community Profiles. In Wave 7, EDI data was collected for over 43,000 kindergarten children. The bar graphs on this page show the percentage of children in BC who are vulnerable on the scales of the EDI. On the summary measure Vulnerable on One or More Scales, which reports the percentage of children who are vulnerable on at least one of the scales, but may be experiencing vulnerabilities in two, three, four, or all five scales, 33.4% of children in BC are vulnerable. That means that over, that means that one third, or over 14,000 children, are arriving at school vulnerable on one or more areas of development important to their future success and well-being. Below, the percentages, the percentage for each individual scale is displayed. As you can see, the scales with the highest vulnerability is emotional maturity at 17.7 percent, followed by social competence at 16.1. The scale with the lowest vulnerability rate is language and cognitive development at 10.6%. The number of children represented by these percentages are seen in this column. The profiles also provide information about the trends across time, both the short-term trends from Wave 6, which was 2013 to 2016, to Wave 7, and a long-term trend from Wave 2, 2004 to 2007, to Wave 7. When we look at the trends over time, we are interested in identifying which ones represent a meaningful change. What is meaningful change? We use a method called critical difference to determine when a change is meaningful. HELP's definition of meaningful change is a combination of statistical significance and practical significance, and in all cases should be interpreted as a change that is worthy of attention or worth talking about. A meaningful change also means that we are reasonably confident that this change in vulnerability rate is meaningful rather than a result of uncertainty due to measurement issues. 
This is the icon you will find throughout the report that demonstrates whether there has been a meaningful increase in vulnerability, which is the orange triangle, a meaningful decrease, the green inverted triangle, or a stable trend, the gray circle. Page 32 of the profiles provides some more detail about the concept of meaningful change. Coming back to the community reports, on page 19, the provincial EDI trends over time. This graph shows the trend line for the summary measure of vulnerable on one or more scales of the EDI. You can see the near continuous increase of vulnerability over time for the scale. The long-term trend shows, shows a meaningful increase in vulnerability for the province, climbing from 29% in wave two. And while the short-term trend is stable, there was an increase in vulnerability up from 32.2 in wave six to 33.4% in wave seven. Going back to that idea of 10% being a reasonable benchmark, the wave seven rate of 33.4% is three times higher than we would consider acceptable. Here you can see the trend lines for each of the individual scales and below the icon identifying whether there has been a meaningful change or a stable trend across the short and the long term. This map is not included in the profiles, but provides useful context for understanding your community data. This is the overall provincial picture of vulnerability on one or more scales across the province by school district for wave seven. The darker the red, the higher the vulnerability rates, and the lighter pink or white, the lower the vulnerability rates. What is most evident from this map is that there continues to be significant disparity in vulnerability across school districts and neighborhoods in the province. In fact, the range is for the, at the district level, 13% at the lowest, up to 54% at the highest, and at the neighborhood level, 13% at the lowest, and 68% vulnerability at the highest. This speaks to the fact that children's developmental outcomes are impacted by where they live in the province. If you're interested in understanding more about the provincial level data, we encourage you to check out the EDI Provincial Report for Wave 7, which is available on our website. Each community profile provides information on the demographics and EDI participation of the community. Here we can see that Southeast Kootenays participated in two of the three years for Wave 7. Moving now to the community level data. On page 20 of the profile, it provides the community level Wave 7 data overview. Here we can see that for Peace River South, 36% of children were vulnerable on one or more scales of the EDI. And below, the percentages of children vulnerable on each of the scales is displayed. The gray line, gray line across the bar indicates the provincial level data rate for each scale, providing the context for comparing the community's data with the province. This page also indicates the total number of children involved in Wave 7 data collection for the community. Here we can see that for Peace River South, 547 children's EDI scores have been included. With 36% of children vulnerable on one or more scales, that represents 195 children in this community, community that are vulnerable on one or more scales. And below is the number of children vulnerable for each of the individual scales. On page 21, we see the community trends over time. This is the trend line for vulnerable on one or more scales for this community, which is Langley. The gray line on this graph is the provincial trend line. This community has a similarly increasing trend to the province. However, as is shown here, this community had meaningful increases in vulnerability over both the short term and the long term. Again, the individual scales are provided along the bottom. When looking at this data, some things to consider include which of the scales have the highest vulnerability levels and which the lowest. Here we can see emotional maturity is the highest for wave seven at 16% followed closely by social competence at 15%, and the lowest is language and cognitive development at 10%. Also looking at meaningful change across time is informative, as you can see which scales are the influences for the overall vulnerability for the community over the short and long term. Over the long term, if you look along this line, there has there has been meaningful increases in vulnerability for all scales except language and cognitive development. So all scales except this one are influencing the long-term increasing trend. In the short term, interestingly, we see that the meaningful increases are language and cognitive development, 
and communications and general knowledge. This page is highlighting the differences across BC school districts in terms of vulnerability. Here we see the summary measure of vulnerable on one or more scales. The gray line indicates this community's rate of vulnerability, situating it between all 59 school districts' community data, with the lowest school district having a rate of 13%, the highest of 54%. The same information is displayed in the graphs, called histograms, below for each scale including the highest and lowest school district rates for each scale, and where this community sits within that range. Note that the scale with the largest range is communications and general knowledge, with 2% at the lowest end and 34% vulnerability on the high end. Page 23 talks about multiple vulnerabilities on the EDI. This is a new data point that we have included in this wave. What we are demonstrating here is the percentage of children who have one two, three, four, and five vulnerabilities. There are two graphs on this page, the graph for the province next to the graph for the community. Along the bottom of the graphs are the waves of data. The lightest bar at the bottom here shows the percentage of children with vulnerable vulnerabilities on one scale of the EDI. The next darker bar is the percentage of children with two vulnerabilities followed by three, four, and five. If we add together the percentages for children with two or more vulnerability, we can see that at a provincial level, the percentage of children vulnerable on two or more of the scales is 16.1% in wave two, and it has increased to 19.6%, almost 20% in wave seven. For this community of Coast Mountains, the percentage for wave 2 and wave 7 are provided in the text below the graph. Similar to the province, when you add the percentages together, there's been an increase from 23% in wave 2 to 25% in wave 7 of children vulnerable on two or more of the scales. This is important because it seems that in addition to the increasing rates of vulnerability in the province, the complexity of vulnerability patterns is also increasing. It appears that more children are experiencing increased struggles across more areas of their lives. But it's important to note that not all communities will necessarily see the same increasing trend for multiple vulnerabilities. The next se section takes a look at the neighborhood level patterns and trends. Here we provide some questions to consider that are helpful for reflecting on the community and neighborhood level data provided in the profiles. These questions are only a sample of many. So for example, consider the differences in neighborhood vulnerability. Can you identify particular neighborhoods or areas of strength? Where are the neighborhoods or areas of concern? Are there meaningful decreases or increases in vulnerability over the short and long term for particular neighborhoods? What is the distribution of children across neighborhoods? Or how many children are there in each neighborhood? And how many are vulnerable? How do scale level results compare to other districts or neighborhoods? especially communities that are nearby or similar. There are a series of maps included in the profiles, starting with this map of the summary measure vulnerable on one or more scales. This is a heat map again, so the darker the red, the higher the vulnerability, and the lighter the color, the lower. This legend shows the percentage range that each color represents. So for example, the darkest color is 45% or greater. It also shows the school district average with the provincial average. It's important to note that help designated neighborhood boundaries were created using census, postal code, and municipal plan planning boundaries, and in consultation with those communities to maintain a threshold of 35 children in each of the 298 neighborhoods across the province. Data will be suppressed for neighborhoods with fewer than 35 children. So why are these maps useful? EDI data are mapped based on children's home postal codes and provide a spatial perspective on the variability in vulnerability rates across neighborhoods within a community. As I mentioned earlier, across the province, vulnerability in neighborhoods ranges from 13 to 68 percent in wave 7. So consider the range in vulnerability across the neighborhoods in your community, both for vulnerable on one or more scales and on each of the five scales. There will likely be some neighborhood vulnerability rates that surprise you and some that do not. Reflect on this. 
Sometimes we have assumptions about our communities that do not play out when we look clearly at the data. On this map for Richmond, you can see the vulnerability across the 11 neighborhoods in the school district. It's important to note not only the vulnerability rates for each neighborhood, but also the number of children living in those neighborhoods. You can use the appendix pages, 2A and 2B, to look at this information about number of children more clearly. This is a chart organized by neighborhoods. Here we are using neighborhood A and B in a fake community to show this idea. So here we see the number of children in each of those neighborhoods. So neighborhood A, 128 children, or EDI, total EDI, were included in, in wave seven, and in neighborhood B, 451. Here are the vulnerability rates in wave seven. So for community A, the very high vulnerability at 49%, and community B, 29% vulnerability. This part of the chart shows the number of children then vulnerable as it relates to that percentage of vulnerable on one or more scales. So in community A, neighborhood A, we have 63 children who are vulnerable on one or more scales, while in community B it had a lower vulnerability rate, but the number of children was so much bigger in that neighborhood that the number of children vulnerable is 131. There are two meaningful change maps included in the profile. This map shows the long-term meaningful change across neighborhoods in this community from wave two to wave seven. The legend shows what the colors on the map mean, orange meaningful increase, green meaningful decrease, and gray a stable trend. The thatched area means the data is suppressed or there is no, no, no data for this neighborhood. In this case, the neighborhood with thatched patterns does not have enough children or did not have enough children in wave two to report the data publicly. The legend also shows the number of neighborhoods that have experienced changes in each category. So in this case, four have meaningfully, in meaningfully increased, six have been stable over that long term, and one had no data or suppressed data. So here's the second meaningful change map, and this one is showing the short term from wave six to wave seven. Only one neighborhood that had, has increased in vulnerability, represented by the orange, over both the long and the short term, and that's Shelmont. So if we go back, we can see Shelmont is meaningfully increased and in the long term and in the short term. So those are some things to look for in when you're looking in your own community data. We also see that two neighborhoods in the short term have meaningfully decreased over the short term. There are maps for each of the five scales of the EDI that provide information on the vulnerability rates for Wave 7 across neighborhoods within a school district. It's helpful to pay attention to neighborhoods where their vulnerability rates are consistently high or low across each of the five scales, and communities where vulnerability rates differ, differ between each of the five scales. So here's the map for social competence. There is more consistency across neighborhoods in this map with most neighborhoods in the 15 to 20 percent range of vulnerability for this category. And then when we look at the same community for emotional maturity, you can see that there's quite a bit of variability. So here we see two neighborhoods that are in the 5 to 10 range, three neighborhoods in the 10 to 15 range, and so on. So these are some examples of patterns that you can look for when looking at your community. You can also access our interactive mapping tool to explore the province's EDI data for five EDI scales over multiple waves. To get there, you can click on Interactive Maps on the EDI landing page. Once you've navigated to the interactive map, use the drop-down menu to choose a scale, identified here with the blue arrow. Helps Interactive Map illustrates the results of the EDI at three different geographical levels. School District, so explore EDI data for each of BC's 59 school districts. Also the local health areas, uh, the five geographical health authorities by local health area. And at the neighborhood level, you can explore EDI data for each of HELP's 298 individual neighborhoods. A street level zoom feature clearly delineates neighborhood boundaries on this feature. The map also provides information on vulnerability rates for each of these aggregations, including the total number of children 
and percent of children vulnerable for that area will appear. In this example, I've selected vulnerable on one or more scales, neighborhood aggregation, and clicked on the Oceanside Rural Neighborhood. This page outlines what neighborhood level data you will find in the neighborhood profile section of the profile reports. Each community will have a different number of neighborhoods. Each neighborhood has a two page spread. Here is the first page for the neighborhood Penticton East Naramata. The demographics are provided for each neighborhood, and here's where you can see the total number of children included for this neighborhood in Wave 7. So here it's 220. The gray data and the lines, gray data and gray lines on these pages are the community level or school district data to show this neighborhood in the context of the community. This is the neighborhood histogram showing the Wave 7 vulnerable on one or more scales for this neighborhood, which is 33% in the context of neighborhoods across the province. With a rate of 33%, the number of children then vulnerable on one or more scales is 73 for this district, for this neighborhood rather. And here is the vulnerable on one or more scale trend line for this neighborhood, including information about meaningful, meaningful change. For this neighborhood, the long-term trend has been stable, while the short-term trend is a meaningful increase. What you will notice is that the size of the neighborhood impacts whether or not a change over time is meaningful or not. In small neighborhoods, more change is necessary for the change to be meaningful compared to larger neighborhoods. The second page of the neighborhood profiles breaks down the neighborhood data by scale. Percentage vulnerable for each scale is provided here and seen in the context of other neighborhoods in these histograms here. Then the trend lines for each scale are provided here. The meaningful change icons for this neighborhood are at the bottom, and they show that over time, for the long-term trend, physical health and well-being and emotional maturity saw increases, while social competence and communication and general knowledge skills were stable. You can also see that there has been a meaningful decrease in vulnerability for the language and cognitive development scale over the long term, but not the short term. And that's the only difference between the longer term and the short term trends for this neighborhood. On pages 12 to 14, there is some information about situating EDI data and research in your community. Four things to consider when looking at community data are provided. They include a focus on the local, using complementary data, collaborative and generative conversations, and decision making and action. For example, we recommend considering additional types of data and information that will help to contextualize help data and provide additional insights into the experiences of children and families in your community. Examples of these data include municipal statistics, local health authority information, research by local organizations or provincial bodies, among others. We provide a very small sample of online resources next. So here are some examples of other data sources. First is, this is First Call, Child and Youth Advocacy Coalition, and they create an annual poverty report card for BC. They also break down information by regions of the province so you can find the most relevant poverty information for your region uh, on this website. Municipal websites often have community profiles that include data and statistics from a variety of sources, including the census, this is an example from the city of Vancouver, looking at the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. BC community health profiles are also accessible online. Health data and statistics are organized here by local health authorities. And finally, another example is the Vancouver Foundation's Vital Signs. They produce regional reports that look at uh, things like community connectedness and participation. So this is just a small sample of the kinds of data you can look to to um, see your community profiles in, in different contexts. And this information, this list of uh, possible data sources will be provided uh, on the website below this video. When thinking about who to bring together for collaborative conversations about your community data, we provide some examples here. So for example, coalitions or networks 
or early child development tables, local government, representatives from local First Nations, Métis, Inuit organizations or communities, children and family service providers, health and school district partners, local families, parents, and then consider missing voices. Who are you not connected to? Who are you not hearing from? And how might you recruit their input? On the EDI resources page, you will find the link to this document, Growing Compassionate Systems Leadership, a Toolkit. This document provides more information about the kind of content that is covered in this section of the profile. Here are some final discussion questions that may be useful to guide group conversations about the EDI community profiles. The questions included in this video will be available on the EDI resources page, and we'll be working on making available more examples of inquiry questions and processes for unpacking data in the future. So questions such as, what patterns or trends emerged for you as most important? Are there any community initiatives, plans, strategies that may be useful to consider in light of these data? What additional data or information could you use to help understand or contextualize these data? And what are some next steps you think are important after reviewing these data? Finally, connect with us. You can connect with us anytime if you have questions. We will be hosting some video conferences once a month between March and June. You can sign up for a video conference should you wish to discuss your community profile or have some questions, and you can find details about that below this video. And then please watch our social media, a website, and newsletter for details of upcoming events and webinars. You can always join uh, our or subscribe to our newsletter to keep on top of things if you haven't already. So that concludes this video. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. My email is there. And thank you for watching.